There's a lot of conversation about learning cultures. The reality is many, many organizations are knowing cultures. Do we build in-house? Do we hire externally? Do we maybe do more of gig workers? An organization strategy uh, will help them start to get a, a sense of what the skills might be. And looking outside of the organization and getting a sense of where is the industry headed? What are the major forces at play here? And what are the skills that we need to help employees develop? As a human being, we have an evolutionary impulse, which is to learn and to grow. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Nestor Leadership Podcast. My name is Raluca, and I will be your host for today. And I have with me an amazing guest today. Um, she is Julie Jangawala, and we will talk about leading reinvention, the transformative power of human potential. Julie, thank you so much for accepting our invitation, and uh, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Raluca. Thank you. Julie, I want to start this conversation by um uh, by giving you like the a very short um a very short time for you to help us learn more about you. We want to learn more about your story, more about your experience because I am impressed. Um, I've seen that you are a co-founder of Academic Leadership Group. You are a keynote speaker. You are a, um, an author. You are an instructor at Harvard School. You wrote a book. So there are so much, so many things to say. And um, yeah, help us learn more about you. Sure. So I have about 25 years at this point, I'm starting to age myself, <laughs> working in essentially two fields. One is adult development and the other is organization development. So I've always been intrigued by uh, human beings developing themselves, reaching their potential and how the vast majority of us spend the majority of our waking hours in some form of work and are those workplaces set up optimally for human growth and flourishing? So it has been a wild ride so far and uh, it only ever gets more interesting. So that's been my uh, 25 years career so far. Uh, I'm originally from Northern Ireland. Uh, I grew up there and came out to San Francisco in the late nineties for six months. And here I am still in the US uh, 24 plus years later. And I'm currently on the East coast uh, with my husband, Jay and, our six-year-old Izzy, and Izzy is my greatest teacher to date. That's oh, that, that is probably, I would say, one of my biggest um, biggest learning curves, biggest opportunity uh, for insight into human beings, which is watching a, a human being just a personality, their strengths, who they are, just take shape and form. Thank you so much. And that's amazing. And uh, we are really grateful to have you on the show today and talking more about reinvention. Um, Julie, you are you are a strong promoter of the need to support and enable continuous reinvention. Um, help us learn more about what reinvention means and how we can reinvent our, ourselves. Why is this important? Um, and yeah, how does this help us um, going forward as a, as a human, as a human being, as an individual? Absolutely. So uh, we're defining reinvention as a transformative journey, a transformative journey where you dare to breathe new life into your hopes and dreams. We all have them as children, and some of us are fortunate enough to have those nurtured, and we continue to grow and excel, excel and flourish uh, in our chosen areas. Uh, many of us do not. Uh, many of us learn through an education system, for example, uh, that our skills don't fit into a neat box of academic performance. So many of us find ourselves as adults thrown out into the real world, and the as adults, we are continually learning and growing. And the research tells us that we go through stages of development as adults. I uh, recent, recently heard the phrase, um, you know, your, your first adulthood and then your second adulthood. So your 20s, 30s, and then shifting in your 40s, 50s. And again, we're all working this out in first principles. So uh, it really underscores to me the importance of understanding that 
as a human being, we have an evolutionary impulse, which is to learn and to grow. Mm -hmm. And what if our organizations were incubators, if you will, of that learning and growth? That's amazing. And uh, I think that what, what you are saying and you are thinking of like, Think of, of it like from two perspectives is like for me as a human human, I'm continuously growing. And I think that every individual out there it feels this, but I think we don't realize that because we continue to learn with every experience, with everything that we uh that we do, with every conversation that we have, we are actually growing. So um this is amazing, first of all, to have this in mind and to be aware about this. Um at the same time, I'm looking at um this fast changing market. I'm looking at this um um ongoing um increase of um the needs of the uh, employees with, with uh, within organizations and the technology is changing so fast and i don't know if i can say that we are living in a in an ai driven world but definitely the technology tries a lot of what we are doing how we are behaving how we are growing so so much i want to ask you how what what do you think and how do you feel about skills from this point of view like what would be the most important skills uh going forward would be soft skills would be digital skills would be hard skills um, mm-hmm. how does this make the difference how this help us how we should look from this point of view i know that there are a lot of questions but yeah the curiosity <laughs> is high and um, i'd love to learn more your take on this Sure. Uh, I think it's all of the above. So it's not either digital or soft skills. It's both. And I read I read this uh, at times alarming, but very incisive comment. Uh, I think it was an IBM business report where they said that AI won't replace people, but people who can use AI will replace people who don't. So keeping yourself current uh, with how AI, for example, machine learning will impact your job. Uh, and it it will impact the majority of jobs is important. Soft skills, uh, and uh, the phrase is interesting because soft skills sounds kind of optional, but uh, it's really all about emotional intelligence. And those are the most critical skills in my experience with how you navigate yourself, work with other people, collaborate, get things done. Those will always be critical. Uh, But it was interesting, it was, a conversation around upskilling and reskilling that the reinvention project that my business partner Jenny and I uh, are working on where that idea sparked. So we were in a conversation one one afternoon and we broke out in heated agreement uh, that we were reading all of these reports about upskilling and reskilling and de-skilling. And we said, you know, nowhere here is there any conversation about the messy process of human change. If you're asking somebody to learn a fundamentally new skill, if you're asking them to potentially change occupational category, which many people will do over the course of their career, that's a change in professional identity. Right. That is letting go of something that you know how to do and do well and maybe have a sense of mastery with to being a beginner again. And the human brain is not wired to see that as a safe (laughs) and predictable thing to do uh, and will, in many cases, actively reject it. So Jenny and I were intrigued and said, well, what if we were to interview people who have successfully reinvented themselves? Uh, What could we learn from them? So we interviewed over 50 people and we were uh, digging into these interviews, distilling the data to find out Are there predictable phases? Uh, If so, what are they? Are there, uh, is there a framework here that might be helpful, a guide, if you will? Are there skills, are there reinvention skills that we could identify? Uh, And with all of that, how might that help organizations help their people learn and grow? That's great. And uh, I'm I'm really impressed by doing this together with people and learn more about how they think by interviewing them. Uh, And I think that going to the, to the basis to identify the information that would help you um, maybe 
not a recipe, uh, create a, re a recipe, but create some of those triggers that may uh, may help you going forward. Uh, I think uh, I think this is uh, this is amazing. And because you were mentioning about how this would help organizations um, and transferring this people growth um, and nowadays within uh, um, within organizations is talk we we talk a lot about having a growth mindset um promoting a learning culture uh helping individuals grow um and i think one of the things that we see within uh, within organizations and also one thing that is required from their managers is like you need to support your people growth what do you think about the role of human centric leadership in driving human reinvention and supporting people growth mm. Yes, I think leaders have a critical role to play. Uh, I teach a, a program called Authentic Leadership. And I oftentimes uh, invite those leaders to be the lead learners within their organization and to make their own growth explicit. So where is your developmental edge? What are you working on? And can you make that transparent to the organization? Mm -hmm. Because that sends a really strong message. There is a lot of conversation about learning cultures, but the reality is many, many organizations are knowing cultures. So the leaders taking the first step, showing that little bit of vulnerability is key. Uh, and a great example of this, uh, I read some years ago, uh, a CEO took over uh, what was essentially a pretty toxic organization. The culture was known as being toxic. And after his first uh, first year on the job, he asked a consultant to conduct a 360 on his performance. And that happens all the time, as you know, in organizations, 360s. But what was different with this CEO was he published the results on the company intranet. Oh, wow. Here's what I learned. This is what I'm working on. And I will check back in with you in six months to see how I'm doing. I mean, I'm getting goosebumps just yeah just <laughs> here. <laughs> here. It's, it's simple and it's so powerful yeah definitely and when leaders take the first step and they are showing vulnerability by themselves then also people tend to uh do the same and be more open um but yeah, at the same time, you mentioned about authentic leadership. What would be some other things or maybe what would be some of the capabilities or strengths that a leader, an authentic leader should have in order to be a real leader for their people and influence them maybe and make those people um, follow him? Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, the authentic leaders with whom I've worked, it's really palpable that they have a strong set of values that they live by. There is like a groundedness when you're in conversation with them. They are living their values and that in itself is, is inspirational. They also uh, have gone through usually some tough times and have extracted the lessons from it. So they take a lot of self-responsibility. Mm -hmm. So instead of viewing something as having happened to them, they have the frame of, if this happened for me, what's the lesson? Uh, in the Authentic Leadership uh, workshop that I run, I do this activity called a life map, where I ask leaders to map their peaks and valleys in their life so far. Don't overthink it, you know, quick three minutes, do a sketch. And the debrief is fascinating. Oftentimes what comes up is people say, uh, I learned the most in the valleys. I learned the most during the dark times. Uh, Bill George from Harvard Business School will call this your crucible moments. This is when you really learn. Uh, you learn your whatever the lesson is to be learned. And oftentimes the next stage of your leadership or maybe the next stage of your life. Because what folks uh, additionally say is there is oftentimes a pattern, not always, but often the next peak was as, was as a direct result of the choices that I made in those valleys. Well, so I learned this incredible lesson here, or I 
I experienced this incredible loss, uh, transition, reinvention, whatever it was. And now this is possible, something I, I could never have imagined. Uh, the other side of that is if you haven't learned the lesson, you might find that valley repeating itself <laughs> several times until, until the lesson is learned. Thank you for sharing that uh, with us, uh, Julie. Of course, uh, we know that there are some of the important times in our lives that help us learn so much. Uh, it's important to have the less lessons and uh, to apply them in the future, not repeating the mistakes, um, maybe recognizing or feeling that we recognize some, some of the patterns out there. With regards to the um, people and their expectations, um, we, we've seen lately that employees' expectations or people's expectations in the workplace um, are kind of shifting. Um, and we've seen so many studies out there. Um, most of them or many of them are leaving companies um, because they are not, they don't have um, a paycheck that is um, they want to have, or they may leave managers and they don't leave companies. Um, but the second most important thing or the second most important reason they leave companies are these opportunities for them to grow inside the company? Uh, because I'm coming in a company with some vision, with some some of the things that I may have on my roadmap, as a, my growth roadmap, let's say. And I feel that I'm not growing. So I was wondering, what are your thoughts on this topic? What can organizations do? What can managers inside organizations do so that they help or they can enable growth in their people so that they can unlock their full potential? Mm. Yes, I've got a very practical answer to that. Mm -hmm. So I would love all managers <laughs> to have a, a very quick and easy little spreadsheet or something on a yellow pad if you were to list all of the names of the people who report to you on the left hand side of that page and then have uh, a number of columns short-term career goals medium long-term strengths and growth areas and if you were just to be able to complete that that would give you the map to help your people grow when I ask folks in workshops to do it, nine times out of 10, majority of folks say, I complete that for maybe one or two people, but I, I don't know. The, re the bulk of my team, I don't know. So it would be wonderful. I can see this world where every manager knows that this particular employee, this is these are their large, you know, short, medium, long-term career goals. This is how this job fits into this. This is what they're where they want to go next. And this is how we're helping them build the skills to get there. So at the end of every year, employees can say, I am more employable at the end of the year than I was at the start of the year. Or I continue to be as employable at the end of the year as I was at the start of the year. You know, if somebody has five years experience in a role, uh, a question to follow up with is, is it one year experience five times or did you continually learn and grow during those five years? There's a qualitative difference. Wow. And uh, I have to admit that uh, this opens into my mind like a new perspective. Thanks for uh, for sharing that with, uh, with me, Julie. Um, I'm already feeling that I'm learning so much from this conversation. And with regards to the skills part, uh, you mentioned that, okay, uh, this this may be some of the roadmaps for people to, to grow. Um, but uh, also the reality is that due to the changing business needs, the organizations also need to have or need to be more agile from a workforce perspective. So they may have new challenges. They may have um, to incorporate and use new technologies. So this imposes to them some maybe reskilling programs or upskilling programs or creating some opportunities for for their people to grow from inside maybe or outside don't know maybe you can help us with your input from this point of view and where organizations should should start from 
mm-hmm. in order to fill the gaps? Uh, sure. So an organization strategy uh, will help them start to get a, a sense of what the skills might be. And looking outside of the organization and getting a sense of where is the industry headed? What are the major forces at play here? And what are the skills that we need to help employees develop? And you probably know better than anybody what really the options are. Do we build in-house? Do we hire externally? Do we maybe do more of gig workers? Um, one, another option, which I don't hear a lot, uh, a lot about, uh, which I think is very powerful, is thinking of your vendors, your suppliers as potential partners and talent. So are there uh, options to have a more flexible, agile workforce across your supplier base, your vendor base, maybe even your customer base? What might that look like? Um, Growing up in the UK, uh, there was this concept of a secondment where You would leave your organization and go work somewhere else for a year and then come back. And that was very generative because you're bringing back different insights, uh, new new skills oftentimes, new perspectives, a new network of people uh, that you can lean on and help you within the organization. So the combination of build internally, hire from the outside, supplement as needed, and then thinking more flex more flexibly about all of your partners, vendors, suppliers, Mm -hmm. customers, and what might be possible, this talent ecosystem, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I think in this situation, also maybe the manager or for those large organizations out there, uh, there are some of internal uh, learning and consultants, learning and development consultants that may know how to uh, target the right people for those opportunities that may come maybe from internal, from hiring as well, or external vendors so that they uh, they can uh, upskill their, their workforce as well. I think this is the last question that I uh, I will uh, I will bring uh, into our today uh, today's conversation. And um, as I was telling to you a little bit before, I've already learned so much and you are um uh, you are so inspiring for us because you your journey includes so many uh, inspiring experiences, and um, I've seen that some of them are connected with the um, the education field, uh, with the learning part. Um, you are the founder of the Institute for the Future of Learning and an instructor at the Harvard Division of Continuing Education. How is how learning is evolving from this perspective how do you see the the role of learning evolved in the last period um how do how should we think about uh, this in the future how the future looks um it may be maybe uh, this kind of learning by doing more or uh, is more formal education how 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 what's your take on this and uh, i'd love to, to learn more from this point of view sure I think it's an incredibly exciting time to be in learning and development. It feels like, um, and I'm not sure if COVID was part of this or just the technology is taking us to this place, uh, but I think the to- tolerance for the 45 minute lecture <laughs> is pretty low uh, given just how immersive uh, the learning experience can be through, through different technologies. Uh, I've always been a big fan of experiential learning. I remember uh, this was as a college graduate sitting in my first workshop and uh, it was this wonderful woman, uh, Alison, she was teaching a team building workshop and it was all experiential. And up until that point, I'd really only been familiar with more of the lecture based approach. And it kind of blew my mind or, or I thought on the one hand, this is wonderful. Uh, and I'm getting, I'm, I'm learning so much more. On the other hand, I had no idea this job existed. Could I do that job? That looks interesting. How how do you get to do that? How do you learn the skills that that she clearly has? So I I see things shifting more to the experiential side of things, content being much more bite sized and as needed. Within the K through 12 space, there's a lot of really great work happening with project based learning. Schools such as the new New Tech Network, um, just high tech high wonderful uh, innovations happening there around transdisciplinary project-based learning that take that as a fundamental shift 
from lecture. It requires a complete restructuring of the administrative support that goes along with that, the teacher skill set, how we think about curriculum and pedagogy. Uh, but that's already happening there. And I think that's going to have an impact uh, in higher education and beyond. And there is this other little piece um, that I would love to see more of. I, I know it's in its early stages, uh, but years ago I used to teach conflict management and difficult conversations. Wow. And we would do role plays and role plays are helpful and they also feel a bit clunky at the same time. I think there's an incredible opportunity with virtual reality to build skills in areas where we feel vulnerable and where technology can be an incredible support to build skills until we have greater comfort and facility with, mm -hmm. with the skill that we're learning. Uh, so that when we're in quotes real life, we feel more, more comfortable, more at ease and more capable. And that's great. Thank you so much, Julie, for sharing all of this with us. Uh, indeed, learning by doing and also in a, uh, letting the technology help us in doing that, at least at least uh, starting or acquiring some of the skills that would prepare us in order to practice them more afterwards. Uh, I think it's a fantastic way of using the technology in, um, uh, from this point of view and um, consuming, as you mentioned, like small portions of the content and see how that um, is connected with the things that we do is really important, not like spending <laughs> hours and hours of reading and after that envisioning how we should apply this. Again, thank you so much for joining us today, Julie. Uh, thank you so much for sharing all the insights. Um, and um, we are really grateful to uh, that we had the opportunity to talk with you today. And uh, we are really looking forward to uh, have another conversation really soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Luca. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Mm -hmm.